Good evening, Homesville Church of Christ. Welcome back. We're glad you could join us on this great Mother's Day. Hope you've had a great day of honoring your mother. And today we're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. That is the section we're going to be looking at. Last time, last week when we were together, we looked at verses 1 through 13 of the chapter. Just a quick review to keep you up to where we've been. <clears throat> we know that Paul has encouraged Timothy to be strong, to persevere and endure hardships while he's serving the Lord. Paul also encouraged him last week to teach and to serve with the attitude of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. Remember those examples? And then he finished off by saying you need to hold fast, teach Jesus no matter what the consequences are. There's going to be consequences, but you know what? The rewards are worth every bit of the consequences that may come your way. So that's kind of where we left off last week. So now we're going to be at verse 14, if you'd like to read along with me. Verse 14 says, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. So last week we saw where he was really encouraging Timothy what kind of attitude he needed to have about his teaching of Christ. Now he's getting into some details. And he's telling He's telling uh, Timothy, this is the job of a servant of Jesus. When you're going to teach about Christ and serve him as a minister, one of the jobs that you need to be doing is you need to remind the Christian brothers and sisters that the, the truth of the gospel. One of my jobs here at Holmes Road, most all of you have known the gospel your whole life. Many of you have been baptized for years and years and years. My job is simply to remind you of so many of the truths that are in the Bible. And one of those first big truths that he wants to point out here, he says, remind them not to quarrel. Remind them that God is against people who argue and quarrel and like to stir up word debates and fights. Paul understands that the church is a place that we need to stand for the truth. We need to stand for what the truth of the word says. But at the same time, we don't need to become a debating society where we're always seen as the argumentative people. That, that's not what the church is about either. Getting into silly debates over earthly things or small things that just don't matter, the small little things that distract from the overall truth of the gospel. He's saying, just don't even bother with that stuff. The vast majority of my earthly life in, in Christ, when I was growing up in the church, it, my, my existence in the church early in life was one that saw a lot of this. I witnessed a lot of people fighting and, witness, and, and arguing within the church about the smallest of things arguing and fighting about whether we can clap during a song or whether we should clap when someone is baptized or whether someone raises their hand when they're singing. Some people would argue and fight against this and they'd bring up these scriptures and they'd argue about this, bring up these scriptures. And none of those things, they just distracted. What it got, it got people distracted from doing the job they were supposed to be doing of giving the true gospel, which is Jesus can save you if you're baptized into his body. And we get so in, involved with infighting, we forget to take, take the gospel outside to people that need it. And that's what he is being reminded here. Look at verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So now Paul is challenging Timothy to really keep your focus. Keep your focus on where it needs to be. Be diligent about making sure your focus is on God's word and his gospel. Not about if, uh, if so-and-so is comfortable in their service or if brother so-and-so is, is happy in his pew or if sister so-and-so doesn't like her songbook. All those little things. Keep your focus on God's word and, and the gospel. That's where the minister, that's where a servant of God needs to keep his focus. It can get, it can, we can get so distracted in all the minutia, trying to keep everybody happy, trying to put out this fire and that fire and this fire. For ministers and servants of the, of the church, we need to be focused on God's word and his gospel. And I love where he says, present yourself. I think that is such a crucial phrase when he says, present yourself to be approved. You don't have to worry about how other people are being presented. That's not our job. My job is not to worry about how other people are presenting themselves. 
I can't keep that much account of people, nor can the elders. The elders can't uh, keep track of how often everybody in our church is studying or how often everyone is praying. That's not what we need to be doing. Our focus needs to be on ourselves. Christianity is definitely not a popularity contest. We don't need to be doing anything so that we can be popular or look good amongst people in the church. We need to be only focusing on what do I need to do to present myself approved before God. It's not am I approved by the elders or approved by all the little widow ladies or approved by all the youth group or approved by the singles or young families. No, it's about me being approved by God. And that's where a minister needs to keep his focus. Paul is encouraging Timothy, you focus on keeping self focused on God and simply remind others to be doing the same thing. Look at verse 16 through 18. 16 through 18 says, Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hermanius and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. So in this section, Paul gives an interesting, he gives an example of two guys who fell into this pattern. They got into the little debates. They got into the little arguments. They got into godless chatter. And because they indulged in that, because they allowed themselves to get into all these little church debates, they ended up going down that big slope, slippery slope, and eventually they became more and more ungodly in their teachings. They enjoyed the debates, they enjoyed the arguments, they enjoyed the drama, and they ended up teaching a false doctrine about the resurrection. And because of that, it started destroying people's overall faith. This is why it's so important that we don't let ourselves, that we don't let our churches get involved in these little silly arguments. We can get so distracted from the truth and forget about what's really important in life. And that's exactly what happened to Manius and Philetus. They were two examples of people who got involved in the arguing and the debating and the silly arguments and ended up falling into false doctrine because of it and then leading others to have their faith destroyed as a result. Look at verse 19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with the inscription, The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So coming off of that, that verse 18 section there, 16 through 18, when he gave the example of the two men who lost their focus and who got into the arguments and the debates and everything, now he kind of gives the opposite of that. There is a reward for keeping your focus. If you're not like Hymenus and Philetus, you, you will receive some rewards. And when you keep your focus rightly on handling God's word and reminding others, then you are on God's solid foundation. Paul says you're on a solid foundation. You won't fall. Getting involved in arguing and debating and, and all that kind of, that is quicksand. But when you're on God's word, that's a solid foundation. You don't have to worry about falling. And not only is that not enough of a reward, there's more reward than that. Paul points out that there is a seal. When you're on God's solid foundation, there is a seal on that solid foundation. And that seal contains two inscriptions. Now, folks, we need to remember what, that when we mean by seal, back in those days, whenever you would send someone in a letter, you'd put it in an envelope and you would take wax and you'd drop a piece of wax on it and then you would seal it with, an, with some kind of an insignia ring or something that told people who it was from and that, that whatever was planted into that wax would not only seal it, but it also tell who it's from. And so Paul's using that illustration to say, this is the same, when you're on Christ's solid foundation, when you're handling God's word correctly, you're on that solid foundation, God has a seal for you. He's put his mark on you. And the inscription on that seal, there's two things that are on that seal that God puts on you when you're on his foundation. The first one says, the Lord knows those who are his. An expression of confidence. In other words, God's putting that mark on you saying, I know you're mine. You're handling the word of God right. You're standing firm on the word of God. You are mine. 
You belong in the family of God. The second inscription says, Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from their wickedness. A reminder of our motivation. We, we who are in the Lord, we don't want to sin because we don't want to hurt the, the Father in that way. Sure, we do, but we don't want to, just like Paul said. We often do what we don't want to do because we're human. But we confess His name. And so we try to turn away from that wickedness. And so there's both of these are expressions of confidence. Paul is making us making a seal illustration here that when you're on the solid foundation that is God, and which is God's word, and you have the seal with those two inscriptions, then you know you're in God's family and you have those rewards. Look at verse 20 to 21. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who clean themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Now this one is a really interesting illustration that Paul uses here. Paul uses vessels of honor as an illustration here. And I think, uh, you know, some of us kind of wonder what this is about. But Paul just talked about the foundation of God's building, right? What do you put on a foundation? You put a house on top of a foundation. And so when you're on God's word, you're on that foundation and you have his seal. You're in God's household. You're in God's building. Now taking that illustration a little further, Paul kind of brings in further the illustration that what goes in a house, right? What goes inside of a, of a big household? Well, right now in every single household, there are bowls, there are plates, there are vases, and other such things that go into a house. And this is what is meant by the vessels, the vessels of honor. Some of these vessels in the house, they're used for events of great honor. For instance, at Thanksgiving, Christmas, someone's birthday, wedding anniversaries, we bring out the fine plates, right? We don't, those aren't for everyday use. For every day, we have paper plates. We got that cheap stuff that, that's made of plastic, or we get that stuff that's easy. Who cares if it breaks, right? That's the daily use stuff. But the gold and the silver, that's for special events. And that's what he, he's kind of referring to here. When the gold and silver bowls are used, you know something special. That's th Those things have honor to it because it's a special occasion. But that idea of the wood and the clay vessels, they were for dishonorable things. The wooden clay vessels, they were more things like garbage can bins or ash trays or spittoons. You didn't use gold and silver vessels to throw garbage in or to flick your ashes in or to spit in. Those were for special honorable events, not everyday dishonorable things. And that's what it's really about. Paul is telling, trying to tell Timothy here to make sure you keep yourself in, as an honorable vessel in God's house that is worthy of honor. If you're going to engage in arguing and debating in the church, that's dishonorable. Those events that go on in the household, that's for the clay. That's for the wood. That's not for the gold and silver. You try to be the gold and silver and keep yourself for the special events, for the important things. And what are those important things? Well, the scripture just told us it's being holy. In other words, being different, being set apart. It's staying clean. The scripture just said there, verse 21, those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes. So it's about keeping yourself clean and pure, being useful for the kingdom of God being ready and being willing to work anytime the occasion arises. This is how you can be that gold and silver and honorable vessel in God's household. Look at verses 22 through 23. Here Paul writes, Flee from the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. So we just had that last list and you may ask the question, well, how do I purify myself? How do I stay clean? Well, he just gave us a, a good list again. How we stay clean, how we keep ourselves clean and able to be that instrument for special purpose. How do we, that's how we be that gold and silver vessel is we flee from our youthful desires. We pursue righteousness, faith, love, 
and peace, we encourage others to do the same. We stay out of arguments, fights, and debates. That's how we keep ourselves clean, and that's how we can do that. Look at verses 24 through 26. Paul closes out this section by saying, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Have you noticed how many times in tonight's section Paul has said, don't be quarrelsome or don't get into debates, don't get into arguments? I think that's a pretty important point. He keeps stressing it here. The point is God can use you when you present this kind of attitude. All the things we've talked about tonight, when you present this kind of attitude, God can use servants like that. And he kind of summarized it here. He says, when someone has a gentle spirit to all, not just to people in the church and not just outsiders, but to everybody. When someone has a gentle spirit and they're willing and able to teach and they're not resentful, that word really talks about patience. It, 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 you're not resentful, but you're patient with people and you correct them with love and humility. When you have this kind of thing about you, when you have this kind of attitude, God can use that attitude in really big ways. And that's the reminder that Paul gives Timothy as we close out this section. And so the question I leave with you tonight, for tonight's lesson is, is this you? As we've talked about the attitudes we need to have to be a to be a godly servant for him, to be that gold or silver vessel and not the wood or clay vessel, what attitudes do you need to change so that God can begin to use you to be a great servant of his? Are you willing to keep yourself clean for his service? Are you striving to be a vessel of honor in God's house? Are you keeping your focus on God's Word, not getting involved in all the distractions. That is the lesson for you this evening. I hope it's been beneficial. Let's go to God and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening. Such important reminders. Help us to be a church that, that teaches your Word, that stands for truth and doesn't argue with each other. That we don't waste time getting distracted by silly little things that don't matter. Help us. Help, here, help all the Christians here at Holmes Road to be the gold and silver vessels in your household who handle the word of God rightly and are willing to teach it to others. We ask the blessings in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good night, Holmes Road. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.